It started with what looked like an incredibly rare opportunity. The government became interested in the work I was doing and the expertise I developed in the field of sleep science. I can remember the day the government contacted me like it was this morning. I was in my lab, with research papers piled high all around me, various half-full discarded coffee cups littering my desk. The monotonous hum of the machinery, the sleep research that consumed my every waking thought, day in and day out. I guess that's what I get for getting my doctorate in sleep sciences and studying the sleeping patterns of lab rats for so many years. Everything, and I mean everything, was rem this and circadian that and why the hell won't these motherfuckers sleep anyway? That morning, sandwiched between a stack of scientific newsletters and vendor ads, I noticed an email with the subject, an opportunity of interest. It was from some generic-sounding .gov email address, and, well, I'd be lying if I told you that I opened it for any other reason than pure curiosity. A business proposition. Dr. Adriana Velez, I hope this email reaches you in good health. The Department of Defense thanks you for your innovative work and unparalleled knowledge in the field of sleep science, particularly the research you've done with regard to insomnia. We're getting ready to start up a top-secret and very critical research program that we're going to call, for now, Project Eclipse. The purpose of the project is to fully understand the condition of insomnia, its impacts, and to uncover possible measures to reduce or utilize those conditions in other applications. We believe that your knowledge and background make you an ideal candidate to head up the project. We are confident that this program could advance our understanding of sleep disorders and help many people who are afflicted by them. I'm sorry, but I can't provide any additional information via email about this project for this very reason. Someone from our offices will contact you within the next day or two to talk to you a bit more about this and answer any questions you might have. We welcome the opportunity to work with you and to make use of your knowledge to progress in this important area of research. Thanks. David Nolan, the agent, Daudi. Out of nowhere, my office phone begins to ring. This is Dr. Garza, I said. Dr. Garza, good afternoon. This is Special Agent David Nolan, Department of Defense. You got our email. Yeah, I just got it, I said, looking back at my computer screen where the email was still open. Well, that's good to hear. Like I mentioned in my email, we're spearheading a new project regarding insomnia, and it seemed well within your area of interest. With your background and reputation in the field, we thought you'd be the perfect person to head it up. The man smiled at me, lurched a half-turn in his chair, and withdrew the large folder from his desk drawer and placed it on the desktop in front of him, pushing it across to me. Well, John, if you're as good as they say you are, You'll need to make sure this stays top secret and doesn't leave this room. I hope this isn't outside of your area of expertise. I appreciate your interest, Dr. Garza, he said. It was all very matter-of-fact and very official-sounding. Unfortunately, given the somewhat unique nature of the study, I'm not entirely comfortable discussing it wholly over the phone. It would be better if we could arrange a face-to-face -face meeting so that I can give you a much more a comprehensive overview of the procedures. That way, you can also tour the facilities and meet the staff. I found myself sorely tempted to take him up on his offer to show me the facility. I had so many questions, and this was beginning to seem like my only chance to get some answers. I hesitated for only a moment before nodding. Thank you for the offer, Agent Richardson. We should set that up, if you please. Very good, Dr. Garza. I am confident you will not be disappointed in your decision. I will have my assistant reach out to you to arrange an appropriate date and time for your trip. Thanks, Agent Richardson, I said. I was already excited to learn more about this, and my inner hungry scientist was looking forward to another new and mysterious adventure. The call disconnects, and I find myself left in a sort of anticipative shock. After a long moment of stunned silence, I realize my head is spinning. It was tantalizing. For all my years in the field, I'd been working with sleep disorders, working with the nebulous specter of insomnia, watching patients suffer with sleepless nights and waiting for some sort of breakthrough. It wasn't too much later that my curiosity and ambition got the best of me.
and I took him up on it. An early morning appointment found a black, unmarked sedan stopping in front of my house, a grim-faced man in a freshly pressed suit watching me approach the car with some sort of nodding greeting, but no friendliness displayed as I opened the door and buckled myself in. The ride to the Nocturne facility was silent and weirdly quiet. No road noise inside the car, and the dark tint of the windows kept me from seeing anything beyond them. We passed through several feet of double-wide chain-link gates, each with armed guards stationed at the checkpoints, and I thought for a moment that they were trying more to keep the facility hidden rather than defend the secrecy. The trip seemed to take forever as the nice paved city streets gave way to the rocky gravel roads of rural Wyoming. When we arrived, we passed through masses of high walls bristling with concertina wire. The security was very heavy, with cameras everywhere and patrols watching very closely. We reached a building that looked completely ordinary and uninteresting, blending in with the rest of the ruinous landscape and without any sort of identifying markings. Agent Richardson greeted me warmly, his voice ringing out in the large lobby. Dr. Garza, welcome to Project Eclipse. The agent showed me around the facilities with a quick yet impressed tour and then led me into a generously sized conference room where a handful of people were gathered around a big, high-tech table inside. They watched as we entered, and I knew immediately that I was looking at my new team. Richardson stood and addressed the room. Folks, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Adriana Velez. She'll be heading up Project Eclipse. Dr. Garza, this is your team. I looked about and saw many faces, each different, but all with the same spark of intellectual curiosity, a scientist in everyone. The first was Dr. Emma Torres, a neurologist that looked like she was used to keeping her cool and had that given analytical sharpness to her eyes. The next was Dr. Lucas Grant, a younger researcher and nearly bouncing with enthusiasm at the thought of something to do with neuroscience. Richardson was quick to point out his extensive research in the neural pathways of the sleep cycle. Next was Dr. Ivan Petrov, a Russian emigrant and pharmacologist who'd written his dissertation on the effects of different stimulants on sleep. At his side was Dr. Julia Sanders, a clinical psychologist who had worked with insomnia patients for many years. She had a pleasant smile and very kind eyes. The final member was Sarah Jennings, another project manager and no stranger to the oversight of large research projects. What this project involved was a team of very extraordinary soldiers willing to give up their sleep for the duration of our little experiment to determine the effects of long-term sleep deprivation. Initially, I wasn't sure when the study was proposed to me, but the more I read over the reports, the more intrigued I became, and before long my scientific curiosity began taking over and I found myself getting excited about learning more about the brain and how it worked. We used a very comprehensive and diverse approach to investigate the effects of sleep deprivation. The day-to-day -day regimen for the soldiers participating was very strictly regimented and involved many different activities designed to keep them mentally, physically, and emotionally engaged. The soldiers were subjected to a battery of mental exercises each morning after their routine health checks and blood draws, most of it in the form of complex puzzles and memory tests, to varying degrees of concentration and cognitive flexibility. Dr. Klein and Dr. Lee paid particular attention to these activities, closely observing the men for any signs of mental deterioration. The other key factor was physical exercise. The soldiers were required to maintain a regular regimen of strength and endurance training. I wasn't so much interested in wearing them out physically, the sleep deprivation did a fine job of that as I was monitoring the effects on their physical performance over the long term. They needed to interact in a social manner on a daily basis, and the staff encouraged them to be social, to play together, to talk about their experiences. Dr. Saunders told me that these exchanges were particularly helpful when doing her psychological evaluations. She needed to track their emotional responses, see how their mood changed, and if they exhibited any signs of hallucinations. The soldiers were given specially designed stimulants to stave off the need for sleep, each one precisely engineered and monitored by Dr. Chekhov. 
coupled with advanced EEG scans and neuroimaging techniques, we periodically used the monitoring to evaluate the effects of the drugs on the brain and in response to different neural pathways. The first days of the experiment came and went without incident. The soldiers, being as disciplined and well-trained as they were, acclimated to the new regimen without issue. They were performing their tasks effectively and socializing when not, and it was almost as if they had been stationed here for years. Sleep deprivation effects to this point were negligible and what I would have anticipated. A bit more yawning, a tad slower reflexes, general fatigue. By the end of the first week, the soldiers were exhibiting greater and greater symptoms of extended sleep deprivation. They became less effective in their tasks, both mental and physical. What had been simple puzzles became complex problems, and exercises that had been easily achieved on the first day now became difficult. We noticed it in them as well, though we didn't recognize it until it was pointed out. The way their energetic, animated discussions became shorter and quieter. The way they no longer laughed but simply smiled at one another or sat in mood silence. The brightness of their eyes dulled, and they even began to show signs of mild irritation, lashing out at minor inconveniences. Some people began to retreat more into themselves, looking less at the people around them. At the end of the second week, I could hardly believe that these were the same soldiers as two weeks ago. They were moving slowly and stumbling over their speech, often with a slur. But the psychological deterioration was even more concerning. Most of these men were now enduring mild hallucinations. Their sleep-deprived minds could no longer separate reality from dreams. Some of them reported hearing voices or seeing dark forms flit at the corners of their vision. Corporal Burton was in the chair across from me. Of all of our test subjects, he'd been the most mentally stable, or at least I'd always believed so. But the man that sat before me now was barely recognizable. His eyes were bloodshot and had dark circles beneath them, and there was a disconcerting blankness to his gaze. Burton, I said as calmly and reassuringly as I could, what are you feeling? What do you see? He said nothing for a long moment, bloodshot eyes looking unseeing past me, fixing upon some unseen point. The shadows, he said quietly then, his voice like ragged fabric that was just about to rip apart. They move. They watch. Tell me about these shadows, I prodded. I needed a better picture of his hallucinations. Men, no, figures, tall, dark, and undefined, he said glancing about the room as if something was there that he could not see. They are not speaking, but they are communicating. In my mind, I can hear their thoughts. His hands shook, and I saw the white of his knuckles where he gripped the arms of the chair. They whisper. They say terrible things. Nightmares. Fears. The darkest fears. The worst parts of myself. Do you talk to them? Do you know them? I asked trying to keep the fear out of my voice. He shook his head slowly, and I followed his gaze to a point in the room where nothing stood that I could see. No, they do not act. They only watch, watch and whisper. Are they here now? I asked. Yeah, he said, swallowing. They're always here, always. It was taking a serious toll on him psychologically. This was a guy that had fought and killed real enemies, and now he was reduced to paranoid fear by the darkness his tired mind created for him. It was a frightening visual lesson in the power of the mind and the terrible result of too little sleep. The scientific excitement of these preliminary findings was suddenly overshadowed by the horror of it all. We had wanted to see into the minds of these men, had needed to do so, but inadvertently, we had unleashed a very real psychological hell upon them. But of all the interviews, the one with Private Carson is the one that rattled me the most. Carson, I said, trying to keep my tone even. How are you feeling today? Doctor, someone is watching me, he said. They are always watching me. By what? I asked, searching his face for signs of the hallucinations suffered by Corporal Burton. He waved a hand around the room. They, the other soldiers, they plan something bad.
Carson, you cannot think these men would conspire against you. They are your friends. He narrowed his eyes. Briefly, something of the soldier he used to be, self-assured and direct, flickered. I have noticed them talking quietly, passing looks. They are planning. You don't think they're trying to hurt you, do you? He nodded, and fear began to color his eyes. They're after me. I don't know why, but they are. It was plain to see the cold fear in his eyes. They were suffering from lack of sleep, and their minds were playing tricks on them, seeing threats from where there were none, imagining enemies among their own people. It was becoming more and more obvious that the soldiers were suffering from acute sleep deprivation, and the effects it had on their minds were horrific. They were presenting with symptoms of some very serious mental disorders, but I had to remind myself that this was unlikely to be any sort of permanent condition, but was the result of two weeks of sleeplessness. It was a few weeks after we had started Project Eclipse, and one night in the middle of the night, the whole base was eerily quiet, except for the muffled sounds of the computer servers and my fellow workers in the monitoring team. I was in the lab, poring over the reams of data we had been collecting, trying to make heads or tails of it all and figure out what was causing the strange symptoms we were seeing in the soldiers. The weight of my eyelids increased, and the figures on the screen before me blurred into unreadable patterns. Still, I forced myself to remain awake. It was oddly fitting that I was researching the effects of sleep deprivation, even as I was fighting it. I spent a bit more time, now that I had a look at all the papers laid out on the desk, in the storage room beyond the main lab area, trying to find some more data files. This room was a sort of inventory and archival room behind the main lab, filled with shelves and racks of binders and data drives and more papers. I found it in one of the shadowed aisles, an unmapped cabinet that I hadn't even known was there a few moments ago. In curiosity, I slid open a drawer and felt my chest grow tight and a cold sweat break out on my skin when I saw the folders within, all clearly labeled classified. I hesitated to even tab through them and almost closed the drawer and moved on, an uncomfortable feeling rising within me. This wasn't something I should be looking at, this wasn't something that was meant for the eyes of my own medical profession, but the gnawing wake-up so learn what had happened to the soldiers kept me rooted, kept me looking. My hands shook as I flipped open one of the folders. The page read, The Eclipse Project. Classified, Authorized Personnel Only Project Scope. The end goal of Project Eclipse is to create a unit of military personnel that can perform their duties without requiring sleep. In this way, it's hoped that human resistance to sleep deprivation can be improved, increasing operational efficiency, and reducing the necessity for rest and sleep in military operations. Okay, here's the deal. The experiment involves subjecting a set of highly qualified military personnel with superior physical and mental conditioning to prolonged sleep deprivation. Expert scientists will monitor and document any changes to their cognitive, physical, and mental condition. We'll need a system in place to fight the sleep deprivation and keep folks alert and functioning. We'll use things like medication, physical training, and cognitive behavioral strategies. Prognosis, knowledge of how long a human body can last without sleep. Ways to make super soldiers that don't need to sleep. Ways to push the limits of human capabilities. Something to do with the psychological impact of extended periods of sleep deprivation. Figuring out ways to prevent it or deal with it. FYI, this project is extremely important to our national security and military readiness, but we also understand the risks it poses to those involved. We do what we can to minimize the danger while still getting the job done. The success of the project is largely dependent upon the skill and dedication of the scientific team we select. It is imperative that all team members understand the need for absolute secrecy and remain singularly focused. Access. Granted. Signature on file date withheld. Location, withheld debt withheld. The dispassionate discussion of subject risks and harm mitigation the way they talked about human beings like the were just lab rats. It was giving me goosebumps. 
This wasn't a some sort of scientific study. This was an extremely dangerous and unethical operation that was playing with some very basic facts of all our human existences. I don't know how long I stood there, but I found myself holding that classified file like some sort of ticking time bomb. For the first time since I arrived at this place, it felt alien to me. Everything around me, all the things I'd become used to seeing every day, began to take on an unfamiliar aspect, a hostile one. The friendly greetings of my co-workers, the clatter of the keyboards, the hum of the ventilation got a very unsettling air of facades over everything. Things, sounds, people hiding the real horror of our work. I took a deep breath and shoved the paper back into its folder and the folder back into the drawer. Even though I had no need for it, I made sure everything was put away neatly, then locked the drawer again. I filed away the position of that information in the back of my head, just in case I needed it later. Looking one last time around the records room, I noticed the unremarkable cabinet for a beat before shutting the lights and leaving. My mind was spinning as I made my way back to the lab. What did this mean for our project? For the soldiers? What did it mean for me? What should I do next? I was led to this project with the promise of revolutionary advances in sleep study something that could help millions of people who suffer from various forms of insomnia. But what I'd found was something else altogether. As the weeks went on, I could see the change in the soldiers. More and more of them started showing symptoms each day. These men, who'd been strong and mentally tough, were beginning to deteriorate. The hallucinations kept coming, coming more often, and felt more real. More and more of the soldiers would suddenly start up out of their seats, wide-eyed and fear-filled, staring at nothing or frantically whispering of things that weren't there. One soldier thought some monstrous beast was chasing him, and another thought the walls were moving, closing in on him. Their minds had warped, mutated under the constant lack of sleep. The days had all run together, and nobody could say how long we'd been here anymore. Some of the men just sat there, staring blankly into space, watching things no one else could see. Others would suddenly break into fits of laughter or become violent for no reason. The paranoia began to infiltrate their thoughts like a slow poison, eating away the trust and leaving behind only mistrust and fear in its place. The brief muttered conversations were suddenly assumed to be conversations of conspiracy, and the furtive glances between them mistaken for betrayal. Friendships that had previously been solid were no longer strong enough to weather the mistrust and baseless accusations leveled against them. They began to isolate themselves, sitting quietly at a table alone or only striving to distance themselves as far as possible. Other colleagues sitting nervously with them, their complexions blanching and terror reflected in their eyes. Their minds were failing as well. They struggled with simple tasks and had difficulty following complex orders. I watched one of the soldiers fumbling at tying the laces on his shoes, his vacant eyes barely seeing his fingers. The one beside him couldn't even remember his name. And they began to get more sick. Their complexions grew pale, they lost weight rapidly, and their hands shook all the time. They were jerky and uncoordinated, and their speech was becoming slurred the words running together, forming incomplete thoughts. Most frightening, though, was the change in their demeanors. These men had been vibrant and energetic and courageous when they arrived here, but now they were anything but. Something was wearing them all down, sapping them of their spirits and identity, leaving some sort of vacant shell. Every day it grew a little more maddening, but still we kept at it. Somewhere around that first month's end, the subjects started to show more signs of aggression. The incident with Private Walker is a perfect example. Walker was a pretty mild man most of the time, but one day I was watching the video feed of the day room from the observation booth when all of a sudden, Walker came to his feet. He'd been losing a game of chess to Corporal Martinez and hadn't been showing any signs of previous agitation, but he suddenly started yelling about how Martinez was cheating and he'd had enough. And before anyone could react, he overturned the chess table, knocking dozens of chessmen everywhere. Then he punched Martinez square in the face, out of nowhere. Insane stuff. 
The whole time the two of them are yelling at each other about, you're trying to kill me. And, of course, Martinez wasn't able to speak clearly because he couldn't control his facial muscles, but he sure as shit could scream it angry enough. Walker was still ranting at him, even as the orderlies tried to pull him away and restrain him on the floor. And then, there was the time with Sergeant Barker, a soldier I had rarely seen more disciplined. When he started screaming during mess time one evening, ranting about the food being poisoned and some conspiracy to control their minds, and threw his tray at the wall, spreading food in a wide arc, I had to have the orderly put him in restraint and medicate him. He kept screaming long after they had taken him away down the hall. One of the worst of them was of a young man, a soldier named Private Elliot, who was found by his squad mates in his bunk with a handful of self-inflicted lacerations. He'd been picking at himself, searching for insects that he must have been hallucinating due to his lack of real sleep in the past few weeks. His own horrified face and bloody hands when he was found kept me up for days. And then everything went to shit. It was a Tuesday, I think. Just an average day, anyway. I was in the lab, poring over the data with a fine-toothed comb, when the alarm klaxoned to life, the audible alert for the base to begin a lockdown. Code black! Code black! That's it! came the voice from the speaker. A code black meant there was a violent threat inside the facility. My heart beat heavily as I ran for the control room. And then I ran into the room, and my gaze went to the data feed playing out on the display. And I don't think I'll ever get that image out of my mind, what I saw. It was Private Morgan, one of the subjects, standing there in the main common area with a kitchen knife in his hand, fear and madness in his eyes, and I knew what presumably had already happened. Men and women in uniform and lab coats lay prone all over the floor, some moving, some not, the whole room an absolute nightmare. Morgan was on the screen, raging about something behind the lines of the enemy and how he had to fight to stay alive. He swung something in his hand, some sort of blade, and stumbled backwards into a corner, his eyes darting shiftily about. It was a horrible thing to watch. Agent Richardson was in the room, yelling into the phone and screaming for help, anything, but his calm, cool demeanor was gone, and he sounded panicked. I don't know how long it was before the response team got there, but all it was was watching the horror play out on the monitors leading up to that point. When they came in and wrestled Morgan into restraints, he was utterly combative and unpredictable. He was probably in some sort of sleep deprivation delirium, as he was so jacked up on fear and adrenaline. I'm sure it took a tranquilizer dart to subdue him in the end. Afterward, it was chaos in the rec room. I could hear the patients crying out in pain all around me, and there were more than a couple of blood-stained lab coats and military fatigues as staff rushed to help the wounded. Two soldiers and a nurse died that day, and many more were injured, some quite severely. I can still see it, so clearly, like I just left there yesterday. A scene so terrible that if I live a thousand years, I will never be able to forget or wipe it from my mind. The next day was a bit of a blur. The rec room was reopened once the lockdown was over, but access was restricted. There was no sign of the blood anymore. Someone had done a pretty good job cleaning it up. Agent Richardson came to my office later that day, and he didn't have any good news to share. I was at my desk when he rapped on the door. Project Eclipse is shut down, he said. The brass have pulled the plug on it, said the potential fallout was too great. I knew he was going to say it, but I still felt my breath driven from my lungs as he said it. Something settled in then, something that I'm not sure I can even explain. There are a few moments in your life that are indescribable and must be experienced to be understood, I suppose. This was one of those moments. I remember the long pause of silence that followed his statement and how stifling it all of a sudden became in the small room. We listened to our breathing in the sudden quiet, as well as the vibration of the ventilation and the clock on the wall. My sense of it was that time seemed to suddenly slow down and outside the lab, everything outside seemed to suddenly freeze in place. In the days that followed, they abandoned the facility and moved the soldiers. I was one of the last to leave. The office was all but empty now, 
and I stopped to close the door, knowing that I wasn't leaving just a job. I was leaving something of myself behind. Something of myself that had been broken by unfortunate circumstances and would never be quite right again. The faces of the previous soldiers, the numbness in their eyes, the nightmares, the insanity. They plagued my dreams, they screamed in my nights, and I could feel the burden of their pain as they reminded me of the terrible price of our ambition. Project Eclipse was over, but the shadow it cast still remained. I would never forget the terrible repercussions of that experiment or the cost of forcing the will of man beyond its breaking point. I had learned a hard lesson about the frontier of science and the fragility of the human mind, and it had cost me more than I could pay. My days are very quiet now. I do not work in the sleep lab anymore. I don't want to work in the sleep lab anymore. After Eclipse, it was not possible to go back. I tried to work in other research areas, with other focuses, other than this. In the academic world, I was never able to find the solace I needed. Whatever curiosity I had for the mysteries of the mind is now overshadowed by terror at the thought of learning more, of disappearing into the gloom. But increasingly, I've found myself finding some solace in the peace of a simpler life. I teach psychology at a small community college, and it's nice to know what to expect, to see so many young faces excited to learn and understand the wonders of the mind. I just wish that they are never exposed to what is necessary to uncover such horrors. When I'm not teaching, I work with a local mental health clinic on a volunteer basis. It's my way of making amends for the harm that I caused all those years ago. I help the people who are suffering with their insomnia and other sleep difficulties find peace. It's difficult work, and the progress is slow, but it helps to quell the guilt that still lingers. The ghosts of Project Eclipse still visit me, even now, years later, though I recognize them most frequently in the tired faces of my insomniac patients and the sound of their voices when it's too quiet at night. They serve as a continual rebuke to my actions and my decisions made in the pursuit of knowledge. I find myself thinking about the soldiers some nights when I can't sleep and the sun is still far from rising, wondering what their dreams of those days are like if they dream at all, or whether their nights are as troubled as mine, riddled with the memories of what has been and what can be, haunted by specters of sleep long since past. Even with all of that, I guess I've come to an acceptance of it, a realization of where this path has led me. I realize now that my past has left me with some deep scars, but that's just a part of who I am, how this particular chapter shaped me into the person I am. I've learned how to carry it all, the guilt, the regret, the memories that keep me company in the darkness of the night. But with this understanding, I've also found that I have a responsibility, a need, to help others in my position, to teach those that are ignorant of the dangers that lurk among strife and temptation.